Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we're going to be in Matthew 6 and 7. This is the second part of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I understand the logic of breaking it into two weeks, but I want to make sure we don't lose the momentum we started last week and disconnect these chapters. This sermon is the Savior's attempt to push them into higher living and kill the natural man, overcome the natural man's tendencies and the acts that are often associated with telestial living. So don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't go poking out eyes and stealing teeth. Don't do the telestial things. Come into the terrestrial world. And then the Savior is pushing us into the celestial realm. So it was one change to not do the act of violence. The second change is to change my heart, to get anger out of my heart. Don't demean people and tear them down, but to live like a celestial person and see people like celestial people see them. So last week in Matthew 5, we were very much focused on the difference between telestial and terrestrial, and then terrestrial and celestial. As I see the rest of this sermon, Jesus now drops the discussion about telestial. There's no mention of telestial to terrestrial. But now he seems to be focused on the difference between the good things that terrestrial people do and the good things that celestial people do. And I think it boils down to both of them do good. So it's not their behavior, it's not their action that distinguishes terrestrial from celestial. It's the motive. It's the desire. So terrestrial people do good for reasons that are more terrestrial. So watch what Jesus does in chapter 6. He's going to take three very good deeds, doing alms, fasting, and praying. All of those are good deeds. But he's going to point out, don't do them for a terrestrial reason. Notice in verse 1, he says, don't do your alms to be seen of them. In verse 5, he basically says, don't pray to be seen of men. And then he points out in verse 16, don't fast to appear unto men to fast. Notice that's kind of the same motive, and he's really emphasizing that one terrestrial motive for doing good is to receive the credit for it, to be acknowledged. Now, you are doing good. It's not that you're doing a bad thing, but to do good and want to be acknowledged for it is the terrestrial act, and the invitation is to rise up and be celestial. Because if you watch how Jesus does his alms, and how Jesus prays, and how the Savior fasts, it was simply to tie him to the Father. Do you remember that moment where the rich young ruler comes to him and says, good master, what good thing do I have to do to be saved? And he instantly says, no, don't call me good. Call the Father good. It was always credit to the Father. He wasn't seeking goodness for his own sake. So that would be one terrestrial attitude. So I think it would be valuable this week to have a conversation with yourself, a spouse, a family, your class. What are some other terrestrial motives for doing good deeds? And make that list and have that discussion. For example, sometimes in the church, we do good because we seek a reward. I quite often hear youth say, well, I'll go to the fireside because they're having refreshments and it's my favorite donut. In other words, I'll go to the fireside because I want a reward. Or I've heard a lot of people say, I'll go do the good deed because I need the blessing. So I'm going to go do good so God owes me. That, I would suggest, is not a celestial attitude. The celestial attitude would be more like, I want to do this for Heavenly Father and for His children. 
Another reason that Latter-day Saints sometimes do good things, like go on a mission, is tradition. We have established a tradition of doing good. And so sometimes we do good because it's just a tradition. Now, again, that's a good thing. We're doing good. But we've allowed the motive for doing good to slide to that terrestrial category. Another one that I see often in the church is we do good out of guilt. I have to go. I have to do this, or else I will feel guilty. Avoiding guilt becomes a motivation for doing good. So what are your motives for doing good? What are your motives for serving in the church? What are your motives for completing an assignment or going to the temple? Sometimes I've watched youth go to the temple and deliberately stay dressed up, and they love to tell people that they went to the temple. And I wonder, I don't know, I'm not in their head, but I wonder if their reward for going to the temple was the praise that other people gave them when they told them they went to the temple. I would submit that that might be a terrestrial motive. And it's also on the other side where some say, I just like being dressed like this because it reminds me of where I've been today, and I feel like I'm taking the temple with me. We don't know their motive. Only Father can see our motive. Yeah. Let's not judge other people. Let's not point our fingers and condemn, but maybe pause and ask ourselves, what are my motives? Why do I attend the temple, and why do I fast? Do I need to point out to other people that I'm fasting? So that's why Jesus says things like, when you fast, don't appear unto men to fast. Fast in secret so that your Father knows, and you don't necessarily need the other people to know. So I think that's the kind of gist that we're going to see. We're going to see it again in chapter 7, where people say, Lord, Lord, I've done all these good things. I fasted, I went on a mission, and I serve in the church. And Jesus is going to say, but you never knew me. Your motive for service wasn't to connect with God. It was other reasons. Jesus will say repeatedly things like, I do always those things that please him. That was his motive, to please his Father, to connect with his Father, to do the work that his Father gave him. Yeah. I really like chapter 6 of Matthew in this sermon and looking at our motives, and there are some other interesting ways to read it as well that kind of lead us to other places. So in a temple context, which I think this is a temple sermon, and I think Jesus is speaking on multiple levels, if you look at the word for alms, it says, take heed that you do not your alms before men. Uh, That first bit there, in some of the texts, that word for alms is works of justice, But then you have works of mercy in verse 2 and 3. It's a different word that's used in some of the text. So we have something going on with your right hand and your left hand, probably ritual actions with your hands having to do with justice and mercy. And it's really interesting if we remember the last thing that he said in verse 48 in Matthew 5 is he's going to make us finished or complete. So he's bringing us to a state of completion. And so after we have this with our hands actions of justice and mercy. Then we have this discussion about prayer, and he even says how to pray, and it's this example. And in the midst of this prayer, we read in verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Now, that's a really interesting phrase that the translators worked with. The word that's used for daily is epiusion, which is a couple Greek words, epi, which means upon, and usion, which is this idea of being. And so literally, it's this being upon bread. But I think what Jesus is doing is he's harking us back to the narrative in Exodus 3, where Moses asks Jesus what his name was, and the Savior says, or Jehovah says, I will be what I will be, or it's translated as, I am what I am, or I am that I am. This is the connection with being. In other words, I think another way to read this in verse 11 is the Savior saying, give us our Yahweh bread, our being upon bread, because he is the God of being. I think he's hearkening back to this idea of who he is. And in the temple, at least in the first Israelite temple, there was this 
bread that would be eaten in the second room, in the hakal, and that bread was indicative of a future feast where the king will feed everyone. And on the Feast of Tabernacles on the final day, the king would feed everyone bread. And we read this this miraculous feeding is actually contained in 3 Nephi. We see this in 3 Nephi 20. On the second feeding, verse 6 of 3 Nephi 20, Mormon says, "...now there had been no bread, neither wine brought by the disciples, neither by the multitude, but he truly gave unto them bread to eat and wine to drink." And he said unto them, He that eateth this bread eateth of my body and soul. The bread, the being upon bread, is this invitation to become one with Jesus. We do it in the sacrament all the time. Every week when we take the sacrament, we are practicing this eating that one day the king will feed us. When we read about this in section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord says, Marvel not, but one day I will feed you. And so it's a beautiful prayer, and I see this in the context, once again, of the temple. Remember, we're moving towards God, we're progressing towards God. So with prayer, we read in verse 17 that that we're anointing our head and we're washing, but then we're proceeding towards a treasure. Now, in the temple, there was a treasure box in the Holy of Holies, and that's where we're moving. But prayer is part of this journey. As we're approaching God, In one way, you could say this, um, as we approach God, we part the veil between us and God by prayer, and we listen for his voice, and we communicate with him. And when we communicate with God through prayer, that's part of a disciple's journey. And notice how often Jesus throws in little phrases that talk about the very best way, one of the absolute very best ways to become more celestial— in this mortal existence, is through communication with Heavenly Father. Heartfelt, genuine prayer. To pray more and to pray better. Let me just point out a couple things Jesus is throwing out about how I can pray better. I love that he says in verse 7, don't use vain repetition. It's not the words that matter as much as it's the connection with God. I think one of the challenges that we all face today is prayer has become a tradition. If I were to say, bless this food that it will, what phrase just jumped into your head? Some of you probably spoke it out loud, right? Nourish and strength. You know what to say after that. That phrase is so frequently repeated that sometimes it loses its meaning. And we need to be careful that prayer be a genuine reaching out to Heavenly Father. When I was a little boy and my mom was listening to me pray, one night I said, bless that, and I panicked and I froze and I was silent for a long time. And then I blurted out, bless that the Indian chopper won't fall upon us. And my mom was so puzzled. And for several days, she just, why would Bryce say, bless that the Indian chopper won't fall upon us? And then all of a sudden it dawned on her. I had picked up the phrase, bless that no harm or accident will fall upon us. And my little brain, my little boy ear heard, bless that instead of no harm or accident, I heard, bless that the farmer's axe won't fall upon us. And I thought my mom was stopping a disaster every night by asking that the farmer's axe wouldn't fall upon us. And one night I panicked and forgot the phrase, and so I blurted out, blessed that the Indian chopper won't fall upon us. And bless my mother's heart, she took that as a wake-up call to say, maybe the repetition of these frequently used phrases is not really conveying what prayer should convey. And I really love that story because it really causes me, when I pray, to say, am I just saying it, or am I really trying to connect with God? Do we need to bless the food? Is it cursed? Are we going to die if we eat it? I remember one time as a child at a court of honor, the person saying the closing prayer didn't bless the food, so guess what we did? We said another prayer to bless the food. Now tell me what that said. What message does that send to a little boy? That food is cursed and you're going to die if you don't lift the curse. And I wonder if we've gone a little bit too far instead of saying, look, let's pause and talk to Heavenly Father before we eat this food. 
Let's remind ourselves how much we love him and how grateful we are for his blessings. Maybe we're motivated by some terrestrial traditions. And Jesus is saying, don't use vain repetition. Pray, connect, talk to him like a child talks to a father. The other one I want to point out is in verse 8. Your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask. Prayer should not be me trying to convince God to give me the blessing I want. I don't think there's anything wrong with that initially saying, Lord, this is the desire of my heart. One of my favorite phrases in Joseph Smith's first vision in the prayer, he offered up the desires of his heart. I think that's what prayer should be, is the offering up of the desires of my heart. But there comes a moment where I need to let go and trust that what he knows I need is more important than what I'm asking for. There comes a moment where I need to say, Lord, here's the desire of my heart, but if that's not the right thing, then let me accept thy will and what you know I need. Notice the language, your father knows what things you need. And I love the Savior's prayer in Gethsemane. I can't help but see an initial request for the Savior to say, I don't want to do this. Can I ask, is there another way to accomplish this? Can I ask that the cup be passed? I think Jesus was offering up a very sincere personal desire, but then he let go of that and accepted what he knew the Father knew was in his best interest and all of our best interests. So connect with God, but don't turn God into a repairman. And prayer is simply you putting in your order for the next blessing. Talk to him. Commune with him. Go back and forth. Listen to him. And if if you're asking for something and you sense it may not be something he wants to give you, give him the prayer you would ask, and then give him a but if not. And then ask for something you know he wants to give you. That has changed my prayers. For example, I know a dear sister who just gave birth to a baby, and he is not sleeping at night. And her prayer is, Lord, bless my baby to sleep tonight. Let him and me get some rest. Now, that's a decent prayer. I think that's wonderful. But then she's learned to include a but if not. Lord, bless my child to sleep tonight. But if not, help me be patient and kind and loving towards him tomorrow. I know Heavenly Father wants that. It's the difference between, Lord, help me be accepted by my friends. But if not, help me accept them and seek other people who feel like they're not accepted. I know the Lord wants to bless me with that blessing. I love this description of the Savior about prayer connecting us to Heavenly Father. Yeah. And so in the context of a temple setting, as we pray, we proceed towards the treasure. Verse 19, lay up not for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I see this in a lot of ways. One of the ways I see this is Jesus saying, hey, don't focus on the treasures of the earth. And In the temple setting, we're moving towards the treasure box. We're moving towards the Holy of Holies. And remember, that's on top of the threshing floor where the seeds are. And the seeds represent us. The Lord wants us to be gathered to him. And there's lots of ways he teaches this. Throughout the New Testament narrative, he talks about fishing. But in the Doctrine and Covenants, he talks about going and threshing the nations and the sheaves that will be laden upon your backs. And the threshing floor is the place of judgment. It's also the place where we sift the wheat from the chaff and we gather everything in to the place where the Lord is. And so this treasure, to me, is our seed. It's our family. 
And so in verses 24 through 33, we read a message of consecration. No man can serve two masters. You have to pick which side you're going to be on, and you have to trust God. And so he talks about these things, like the typical things that we worry about. How am I going to eat? How am I going to provide for myself? And the Lord tells them, let me take care of you. If you trust me, I will take care of you. He says in verse 28, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Now, when I read that about God clothing the grass, it reminds me of Isaiah 40. I'm just going to read a couple of verses, but Isaiah 40 really should be read in context with Matthew 6, because we're in both places. We're in that second room. We're in the hakal. We're in the room where the table of shoe bread is. We're facing the veil. We see the altar of incense in front of us, and to our left is the candlestick. And this is where the priest cries, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That's Isaiah 40, verse 3. And then it says in verse 5, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. So we're in the space where we're about ready to see the Lord. And then notice what Isaiah says in verse 6, all flesh is grass. Verse 7, the grass withereth the flower fadeth, surely the people is grass. Isaiah 40, 7 and 8 tell us that all flesh is grass. And so knowing this sheds light on what Jesus is saying in Matthew 6, verse 30, also Psalm 103, verse 15. Isaiah 40, in my view, goes along with John chapter 1. We've already talked about John chapter 1, but it also goes along with 1 Nephi 10 and Alma 7. As all of these passages talk about a priest who challenges the saints to, quote, make straight the way of the Lord, so that all flesh shall see the glory of the Lord. That's Isaiah 40, verse 5. We then read that the Lord will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather his lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. That's Isaiah 40, verse 11. To me, this invitation that is happening here in Isaiah 40, we see it also in Alma 7, we see it in John chapter 1, is an invitation to come unto Christ, to come to the second feast in the Holy of Holies, which is indicative of God's presence. And that is also contained in Exodus 24 and DNC 27. So I see this in the ritual context, but I also see it as a very beautiful sermon where the Lord's just saying, hey, trust God. So in other words, I see the Lord speaking in code. He's talking about so many things. But if you've ever wondered, like, why is this constructed this way? And why are we proceeding in this fashion? My belief is that this is the endowment, and this is literally published to the whole world. And we talked about it with Matthew 5, the five covenants that we make in the temple. It's in the Church Handbook of Instructions. The five covenants are right here in the Sermon on the Mount, and they're also placed in this ritual setting. And so I think it's almost as if the Lord is trying to teach it in whatever way it can be taught. And so when this happens, when he invites them to be clothed, and then there's this feeding going on in verse 31, then he says this, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And all these things to me is all the things that God has. Section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord says this, Whoso is faithful unto the obtaining of these two priesthoods, of which I have spoken, and then it talks about what they receive in verse 35, these people, all they who receive this priesthood receiveth me, saith the Lord, and he that receiveth my servants receiveth me. Remember, we're listening to the priest. It says, make straight the way of the Lord. And he that receiveth me receiveth my father, and he that receiveth my father receiveth my father's kingdom. Therefore, all that my father hath shall be given unto him. And this is according to the oath and covenant which belongs to the priesthood. That's section 84, starting at about verse 33 to 39. Those verses to me really do fall in line with the promises that Jesus is extending to his followers in the end of Matthew 6. Now relax your eyes a little bit. So notice Jesus starts focusing on our heart, our eyes, and our head. 
when he says, lay not up treasures on earth that moth and rust doth corrupt, what he's really saying is, don't treasure the wrong things in your heart. Notice the emphasis in verse 21, to heart. And then in the very next verse, he's on to our eyes. The light of the body is the eye. What do you look at? And then in verse 25, take no thought. Do you see that? We live the celestial law not outwardly with what we do. We live the celestial law inwardly with what's in our heart, what's in our head. What do we look at? Can you see the significance of going into the temple, which is an invitation to be more celestial, to rise above the terrestrial. And the very first thing I do in the temple is I wash my eyes and my ears and my heart. I wash the inner part of me to live the celestial law. What he's really saying in this chapter is put celestial things in your heart. Look at celestial things with your eyes. Think and trust celestial things with your thoughts. I know you're worried about food, and that's a good thing. Feeding your body is a good thing. But trusting that Heavenly Father loves you and will help you with those things is a celestial thing. Check out your Joseph Smith translations in chapter 6. In one Joseph Smith change, he adds, Go ye into the world and care not for the world, for the world will hate you and will persecute you and turn you out of their synagogues. Care not for that scorn. In another JST change, he says, seek not the things of this world, but seek ye first to build up the kingdom of God. What is in your head, what is in your heart, and what is in your eye is really how we live the celestial law. Let me give you a Book of Mormon example to what he's trying to do in Matthew chapter 6. In Lehi's dream, there are four different groups of people. Four times, Nephi says that Lehi saw a group of people. One group goes straight to the building. One group commences in the path but never grabs the rod and never makes it to the tree. So two groups don't make it to the tree. Two groups do. One group makes it to the tree and leaves. One group makes it to the tree and stays. Now, what's the main difference between the group that stays and the group that leaves? First Nephi chapter 8, verse 25. After they had partaken of the fruit of the tree, they did cast their eyes about. See, they're looking at the wrong thing. They're looking at at what people are thinking of them as they partake of the tree. They're worried about what people think about them. Do you see that whole message in Matthew 6? And because of that, when they cast their eyes about, they're ashamed. And this people, notice verse 28, they don't wander away like the other group. They fall away because they're worried about the wrong things. The people who do not leave, the people who get to the path and stay, heeded them not. That doesn't mean they didn't care about that. They did care. They were very much caring about other people. But they heeded them not because what was in their head, what was in their heart, and what was in their eyes was the glory of the Father, His fruit, and the fruit of that tree. So I think that's Matthew chapter 6. It's an invitation to be more celestial by caring less about what the world thinks. Now, the King James of Matthew 6.34 reads, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now, I got to tell you, Bryce, that has always troubled me. And one of the first things I did when in my Greek classes was, okay, I really want to know what is going on behind this verse. And so there's a lot of different ways to read it. I'm going to give you another translation. This is from R.T. France. He translates it as follows. So don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Today's own troubles are enough for today. I like that. That's a good translation. 
In the show notes, we give you the Greek, and I give you kind of how I translate it, and I read it like this. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious about itself. The problem or the bad or the, the difficulty of today is enough. In other words, I think what the Savior's trying to say is, focus on what's in front of you. Now, that's great counsel. I think verse 34 is probably best read in the context of the sermon, specifically as it relates to verse 33. We should seek the kingdom of God. And when we do, that may be troubling because we see, you know, we see all these other things that could probably take away our attention. But I also see both sides. I do see wise counsel from the Lord where he does say, hey, we do need to plan. There's a wonderful parable where he says, if a man's about to build a castle or if he's about to go uh, into engage in warfare, he's got a plan for those things. So I really see both. But in the context here of this sermon, what I do see him saying is, if you trust me, we're going to get you through the day. And so with that, we're going to go into chapter 7 of the sermon. And here is where Jesus is speaking about judgment and how can we make distinctions in this world. Or really, how do we judge celestially? Jesus did not say in verse 1, judge not. He didn't tell us not to judge. That would be foolish to not judge. Who would you hire? Who would you marry? If you didn't make judgments about other people, you would make very foolish decisions. Marital decisions and hiring decisions would be a disaster. And you can see that because notice in verse 6, he says, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Well, how do you know who the dogs are without rendering a judgment? So he couldn't have said, judge not, and then say, don't cast your pearls before swine. What he said, and I love the Joseph Smith translation here, what he seems to have said is, judge not unrighteously, but judge righteous judgment. I really like Matthew 7, 1, me crinite. I, I like it, and I think that, you you know, judge not is kind of how it's translated. Uh, the the crinite comes from crino, and it means judge, but it also means like separate or draw distinctions. And so I really think this is tonal. I, I really see this as Jesus very well could have said this exact phrase, and the people there understood what he was talking about, and the spirit of what he was talking about is exactly what the Joseph translation is rendering. In other words, he's basically saying, don't judge the way that we typically do, but we have to judge, we have to draw distinctions based on how we want to be judged based on the fact that this person is my brother, verse 3. So I really like this. So let's judge better, more celestially. So notice his focus again is on my eye. Now the problem in verse 5 is that I don't see clearly. If I saw clearly, I would judge better. Now in his particular case, the reason I don't see clearly is because I've got this beam in my eye. And I'm trying to remove the moat in your eye, but I don't see clearly. He says, take the beam out of your own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast the moat out of your brother's eye. Then you'll be able to judge better. Let me throw a few verses out there about what God sees when he judges. And you ponder in your heart do you take time when you judge others to see these same things? The first one is in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Saul has fallen from grace, and Samuel has been sent to find a new king. He knows it's one of the sons of Jesse. He gets to Jesse's house, and in walks Eliab, this tall, masculine, very majestic-looking man. And Samuel makes a judgment based on what he saw. He assumed that Eliab was the new king. And the Lord says, uh, 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 you are not seeing clearly. You saw his height. You saw his broad strength. You saw the outward. That is not what God sees. If you want to see clearly, you must see what God sees. And so he tells Samuel, this is 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, 
for I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. If you're going to judge better, you need to see what's in their heart. The beam in my eye is I am focused on their behavior. I'm focused on the outward. I'm focused on what they said and did, the way they smell, the way they look. And that beam is preventing me from seeing clearly. So see them the way God sees them and that God sees the intentions of their heart. And that's going to take some time, and that's going to require a dialogue. But before you render judgment, see clearly the intentions of their heart. A second one is in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 46, verse 15. Couched in the language of the gifts of the Spirit is a description of the gift of the differences of administration. It might be called the gift of judging clearly. Because the last sentence of that verse, I believe, is a description of how God sees. It says that God suits his mercies according to the conditions of the children of men. He sees the bigger picture. He sees the circumstances. He accounts for what's going on when he renders a judgment. Now, my sweet, wonderful wife said something a little harsh to me once. Would it make a difference if I told you that she was giving birth without an epidural? You see how that completely changes the circumstances. In that circumstance, you say all the things you want to say. So often, if we saw the circumstance, we would suit our mercies differently. Imagine a student who was caught by the high school breaking into their refrigerator and stealing food. Now, if I saw just that act of breaking in and stealing food, I would be pretty harsh. But what if I saw the whole circumstances and knew that he and his brother had not eaten for days because their parents were not taking care of them? And as an act of desperation, he broke in to take some food home for he and his brother. Would knowing that circumstance change your mercy? It's very different. See the person and not the transgression. Now, from the context of a temple setting, we're moving towards God, towards the place of judgment. And remember, it's on the other side of that veil in the Holy of Holies on top of the threshing floor. The threshing floor in antiquity was the place of judgment. It was the place where so many things are happening. It's the place of the first drama. It's the place where we bring the seeds. It's the place where the government would originally come and tax you and make a judgment on how much you owe the state. It was the place where people gave charity to individuals who were poor. It's the place where debts were paid. And so as we're doing this, we are to draw distinctions. And so right there in verse 6, the Savior says, "'Give not that which is holy to the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine.'" Well. Sacred things have to be sacred. We have to draw distinctions and know what we're doing and who we're talking to. And then what do we do in verse 7? We ask, seek, and knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So from the perspective of the first temple, that's where we're invited into God's presence. And so what do we have here? We have this exchange of messianic symbols. He that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And we have four messianic symbols here in these verses, chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. We have bread, stone, a fish, and a serpent. And there's an exchange. Now, I know on one level the Lord is saying, yes, you, verse 11, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good gifts? things to them that ask him. And that's a true principle that God gives to those who ask. As we read in James 1, 5, he's not going to upbraid me for asking. He wants to give liberally. Yes, but this is also this invitation to come to the Father. And who brings us there? The Savior. And so verse 13 and 14, he's bringing us through the straight gate. It's straight and it is narrow. And then as we do this, We have to be aware of 
false prophets in sheep's clothing. We have to follow true messengers as we approach the Father, and then we we move past the thorns and thistles. Now, that's, to me, a direct reference to Genesis 3.18. When Adam and Eve are cast out of Eden, out of God's presence, they pass through the acanthon and tribulon, the thorns and thistles, and they come past the thorns and thistles into this world of a fallen state. Now we're reversing that process. We put in the show notes a really good picture of the temple being a reversal of the fall. So Adam and Eve left God's presence past the angels or past the cherubim that guarded the way of the tree of life. And now ritually the savior is inviting all of us to come back into God's presence. And we're now leaving the account on a tribulone, the thorns and thistles of mortality. And we're coming to the sacred space. And so what does he speak of next? A tree. Well, what was in the original Holy of Holies? We talked about this throughout the old Testament podcast. As we discussed the first temple It had a tree inside of it, a tree that represented God's presence. This is also in concert with Nephi and Lehi's vision in 1 Nephi 8 and 11. As we're ritually holding to the rod, we're approaching the tree. And how do we know if it's a good tree? By its fruits. And then when we do, verse 21, we enter into the kingdom of heaven. And what is this kingdom? It's upon a rock. That rock is Christ. That's verse 24. It's also Helaman 5. But that rock is also that Eben Shetia, or the foundation stone that was the rock that was the threshing floor of the Holy of Holies, where the original temple was constructed on top of that rock. And so what do we do? We build our house upon the rock. That's verse 24, 25, and 26. And when we do, the rains can descend and it's going to be okay. Why? Because a wise man builds his house upon a rock. And to me, that rock is Christ. That rock is his teachings, his wisdom. It's the wisdom of God. Now, remember that idea in prayer, and God knows what I need? Let me take you back to this idea of, hey, which, which one of you, if your child asked for a fish, would give him a serpent? If they asked for bread... Would you give them a stone? Sometimes we turn what God gives us into a stone. Sometimes the terrestrial murmurings in our heart are that God didn't care, or God doesn't love me, or my problems are stones. But God doesn't give stones. Your Heavenly Father doesn't give stones. And we need to resist the terrestrial thinking and murmuring of assuming that God is giving me a stone. He wants me to be saved. He's trying to get me into the celestial kingdom. He's trying to help me change. Now, sometimes in his desire to help me change, it hurts. Do you remember what he had to do to the tree in Jacob 5? He had to trim it. He had to pluck it. He had to graft in new branches. And those are not stones. We have to trust that Heavenly Father knows what's best and is allowing me to have the circumstances that will lead me to the greatest amount of happiness, and that any painful experience in mortality is a loving Father guiding me back to His presence. Do you see that temptation for terrestrial thinking? We sometimes turn His blessings into stones. And then we get to this verse in 21, not everyone that will say, Lord, Lord, entereth into the kingdom, but he that doeth the will of the Father. There are going to be people who express a desire to go to the celestial kingdom, and they are going to be told they can't. They're going to say, Lord, we've done all the good things. We've prophesied in thy name. I went to church, I held a calling, I went on a mission. I've done the good things. They may have done them, but their motives for doing them were not to connect with the Lord. In the text, it says, I never knew you. But Joseph will change that in the JST to you never knew me. The reason we should do good is to get to know him 
It's to be like him and think like he thinks. If the end result of our goodness is simply the deed, we've missed the point. The end result of our goodness is to know him, to love him, to want to serve him. So I think this week's Come Follow Me is an invitation for all of us to check our motives. Do we trust God will feed us? Do we expect a blessing to come, but will allow him to decide when it comes and how it comes? Do we expect bread, or do we suspect that what he's giving me is a stone? Do we trust him and love him? Are we connected to him? Do we talk to him? And if so, we are built upon his rock, and nothing can tear us off that rock because we know who he is. This is an invitation for celestial thinking, not a condemnation, because we're not all there yet. Please do not read the Sermon on the Mount and beat yourself up or beat anyone else up. Do not weaponize the Sermon on the Mount and turn it into a tool of judgment. It is simply an invitation that all of us need to accept. I don't believe any of us are celestial yet. I may be wrong because I don't know everyone, but I believe all of us need to accept the invitation. So don't condemn yourself because you're not 100% celestial. No one is. Right, so I kind of see it as a journey. It's a long journey. Right, and he's pointing to where we're heading. That will extend well beyond death. Yeah, he's going to get us there. So as you study these scriptures, look for the invitation to rise above terrestrial attitudes, terrestrial thinking and see the celestial thinking that you're invited to follow. And with that, we thank you for your time. We will see you next week when we cover Matthew 8, Mark 2 through 4, and Luke 7. And we're going to do portions of Luke 8 as well. Have a great week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.